Hello, I'm Ben Kingsley, the Managing Director and Founder of Empower Wealth. And as a valued Empower Wealth client, I'd like to welcome you uh, to episode four of Talking Property Tax with Julia Hartman. Now, if you're new to this, and this is the first in the series that you're watching of Talking Property Tax, this is our tax education series led by Julia Hartman, who's one of Australia's leading tax experts when it comes to all things property investment and personal tax matters. Now, Julia is the founder of Bantax, a tax cooperative group of which Empower Wealth Tax and Personal Accounting is a member. Julia is also our Chief Technical Tax Advisor here at Empower Wealth. So welcome to episode four with Julia. Welcome to the show, Julia. Thank you for having me, Ben. Okay, in this episode, we're going to be covering off on the following topics. I'm I'm really interested in where we're going to take the conversation today because there's some really interesting stuff in here. So let's quickly run through what we're going to be talking about. So firstly, we're going to be talking about the changes to working from home tax claim expenses. That's a biggie. So we're going to be spending a little bit of time on that. Then we're going to look at the capital gains tax effects that most of your assets, including even gifting jewellery. So that might be new news to a lot of people out there. So stick around for that. Then we're going to be talking about, you know, with all of these international students arriving, could you rent out your room to international students and what sort of tax implications will there be there? Then there's some interesting topics on those people who have a little bit more extra land. So there's a couple of things that are happening in terms of two hectare property. So we're going to be talking about um, the main residence exemption and capital gains concessions associated with those. And we're going to finish off the show talking about the, the, the new windfall tax that we're seeing here in Victoria for those two hectare properties as well. So there is a heap to get through in today's show. Um, so let's get straight into the show now, Julia. And I want to start with obviously this big announcement that's come out of the ATO recently around the changes to working from home claims. So can we firstly start with what was the current setup that we were dealing with during the pandemic period where we did see a massive shift of people working from home? Well, as you know, the um, ATO allowed you to have 80 cents an hour um, working from home. You could be husband and wife sitting at the kitchen table and they both got the 80 cents an hour. It must have been, must have really hit the refunds pretty bad <laughs> because, oh, have they changed and it's worse than what it was before any of this came in. All right. So what, what are the new changes that we're seeing when it comes to the 1st of March? So this is we're obviously recording I mean, early to mid-March here. So can you just take us through what is the current setup that we that we had prior to these new changes? Okay. Prior, when we had COVID, the ATO said um, 80 cents per hour that you could claim for working from home and it could be two people in the same room and they both got the 80 cents an hour. It's very generous. Trouble was, it must have really put a ding yeah, in their revenue. A bit too generous, maybe. <laughs> too many people the, were claiming it. <laughs> yeah. So they've knocked that back to 67 cents an hour, but there's no leniency in there. They're saying um, you've got to keep a diary for the whole time, for every hour has to be recorded. So that is massive. Like ultimately it means that in the previous arrangement, did you have to keep the diary for everything or is this a completely new sort of more detailed push in terms of trying to uh, to restrict the number of claims that are coming through? Yeah, you you were previously um, only had to keep a sort of four-week representative sample. You could use your rosters and the like. But so now... this, this is a big change. So we've gone from um, 80 cents, and I've heard you correctly, we're talking about now 67 cents. But is there, I mean, how many people are going to actually, you know, choose to do this in terms of, and record every hour in terms of what they're actually doing? Well, how many people know they should be doing it? This is the Good thing. They question. won't know until next year they go to their tax agent and they've already missed all that time in doing it. But there is an alternative, um, okay. and that's the actual cost method, but you still need to keep your four-week diary, so they still need to do something before the 30th of June. And have you got an example that you might want to take us through in terms of how to explain how that all works? Right. Well, with the actual cost method, um, you have to, for example, record how much electricity you're using, and then it's a question of having a separate room. So you turn everything else off in the house, 
turn on your stuff in that room and work out with your electricity bill how much it's costing you per hour and do it that way. Record a four-week diary. And then you can claim your actual stationery, um, your phone, which is very much at 67 cents an hour. You're probably not getting a very good return on your phone because you don't get to claim your mobile phone. With your phone, you'd need to have to keep a, a four-week diary, and I recommend you do that by taking recent calls, um, going to the recent call screen, take a month, download it on a piece of paper and just put um, work or private, and that gives you the ratio. Then you've got to collect all your bills for the year and apply that ratio across the board to them. Um, you get to claim your furniture. Your internet's a bit of a nuisance because you've got to take into account how everyone else in the house is using that internet, um, which is horrors. Can you imagine trying to get your kids to keep track of how many hours oh, the streaming services, the gaming services that they're all so oh, yeah, that that's quite difficult. Yeah. So really, I think I'd give up on the internet if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, but if you then do more detailed record keeping, does that give you a greater chance of making a more significant claim? I think it would, uh, because if you use your, if you claim, you know, your phone bill's probably over $1,200 and 67 cents an hour for 48 weeks only gives you a, um, yeah, but seven days, uh, five days yeah. a week, only yeah. gives you a claim of about $1,200. So I think it, it would pay you better unless you're only working from home one day a week or something like that. But if you're lose, using your phone a lot, you might be better just claiming your phone or trying to use the actual cost method. I think it's a, it's a really good example. And obviously for our value clients, one of the things you've done for us, which is amazing, is you've created a spreadsheet that will allow for, for you to actually make more detailed tracking for that. Can you tell us a little bit about what's in the spreadsheet that's available for our, for our clients? Everything you need. So you've got both the actual method and the 67 cents an hour method. So you can keep that whole diary for the whole year there, but it also has all the instructions. So while we've just been brief here, yeah. it covers off everything. It's got a spreadsheet for everything you need, an introduction. So And so that also the itemization of all of the things that, I mean, obviously I can see here in our show notes in terms of a list of all those different areas of claims. So you just then add those areas in. So you've done effectively all the heavy lifting. No one needs to create a, a spreadsheet. And that's obviously available um, if you reach out to the Empower Wealth Tax Advisory team, they will be able to share that spreadsheet with you um, as a value client. So that's obviously a, a great story there, but it, it really does highlight that, and it's pretty consistent with, you know, obviously the car claims, right? You have the different methods and the best method to get the most, the biggest claim is usually the full tracking record as opposed to the cents per kilometre flat rate that they charge. This is another good example. If you want to get money back, um, you want your, mo your money to work harder for you, you're really going to have to track everything, aren't you? Yes, I think they tried to set the bars too high and discourage yeah. claims. So let's let's beat them at this game and, and do it properly. Yeah, I think they're definitely working on this whole inertia idea that people just won't do it and hence, uh, you know, they won't be claiming as much tax back. But um, look, it, it's it's important to you for those people who are working from home and, and we know obviously in our business, a lot of our staff now work from home. So really good record keeping is another a perfect example. And what Julia is passionate about is you know, really strong record keeping, not only for, for, you know, annual claims, but also for anything like capital costs and all of those other things, because at the end of the day, they they are what you will be able to claim at some point in the future as well. So thank you very much for putting that uh, that awesome spreadsheet together for our people. Um, and I think that's a really good, important point. Now, I want to move on to the capital gains affects most of your assets. And what was interesting about that, even gifting jewellery is the example that you use here. So, of course, the, the, the logical question that I want to ask is, well, what does this mean, Julia? So if I'm gifting an asset to someone, is there a capital gain event associated with that gifting? Yeah, at market value, if the asset costs you more than $500, so that would in, you know, be jewellery, wedding ring, engagement ring, that sort of stuff that you might hand down, um, you've got to pay capital gains tax when you give that to a family member. 
Um, and can you imagine that over um, generations? It would be a huge amount of tax. On, uh, the, this ring or whatever we're talking about here, yes. right? it's still only you've got to work a couple of weeks to earn the money to buy it. It's the same thing regardless because inflation. But meanwhile, the tax man's come along and said, well, it only cost you $500, but 10 years later, it's worth 100000 oh, Sorry, 40 years later, it's worth about 100000 So we're going to tax you on $99,500 worth of capital gain. Wow. Oh, and I, I suspect there'd be a lot of people watching or listening to potentially the audio version of this going, um, but I've got my grandmother's diamond ring and I've got, you know, so does that, how does all that work? I mean, you know, so can you take us through that example in a little bit more detail in terms of, you know, again, we've got um, some information inside of show notes here. So let's step through that. We talked about, um, you know, um, a, a potential jewellery, piece of jewellery that's being transferred. So step us through that. Okay, well, the example I give in the show notes is the um, engagement ring that let's say it was pre-85 given to the, the wife um, and it was a gift there in that transaction, but it was pre-85. And even if it was, by the, he might have bought it and the day later given it to her. So it didn't really matter. There wasn't much change in value. But if he takes too long, well, they're just proposing and handing over the ring can trigger a capital gains tax event. But anyway, we'll say pre-85. Then yep. his wife dies. And he so the ring comes back to him. He inherits all his wife's assets. Yep. And he doesn't want the ring. He gives it to his daughter. Uh-uh. Well, fortunately, because it was pre-85 in his wife's hands, then he gets market value at the date of her death. If he gives it to her quickly, well, then there's no change. That's all right. But then the daughter, 10 years later, gives it to her son to propose with. So the daughter's got to pay capital gains tax on the increase in value now from what it was when her mother died. And then... Um, for, and now the the son, yep. her son has a cost base of that value, that market value. So as long as he proposes quickly, yep. we're pretty right. But if he takes a year, if she gives it to him too early, and he takes a few years to find a wife, well then <laughs> he's going to have to pay capital gains tax when he gives her that ring. But then say many, many, many years later, the son or the grandson of the original giver. Yeah, so the is, yeah, that's right. The grandson of the original father who gave it to the daughter who gave yeah, it to the son who's yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, right here. I'm following. Yeah. Yeah. So his wife dies and he decides to give it to his daughter. Well, by then, we're talking 40 years then. It's probably yes. worth a hundred thousand dollars. And all we did was, you know, move it up through the, the ranks and only pay tax when the mother got it. Um, so there's probably another 30 years worth of gain. Um, huge amount of tax because the cost base is very, very little. No indexing for inflation. Um, yeah, you get your 50% capital gains tax discount, but you're taxing thin air. You're taxing inflation because that ring is still relatively worth the same amount of hours of work. Rightio, Julia. So the, the, obviously everyone will be sitting on this. the answer to this next question. If I don't gift it to them, but I lend it to them or I allow them to use it, but I still hold ownership of that. Is that a, is that a means by which I'm not in breach of any uh, rulings here? Oh, well, it'd be a question of fact. And I think what most people have replied to me and when I tell them this is they say, how's the tax office going to know? But, <laughs> right. and possibly not, but you think about, you list your documents for probate. Yeah. You know, it's there, they're in the making. Um, yeah, I, I, I really... Well, that is a really good point about the probate. Go. Yeah, you are listing your your your, your items in the will. Um, and so normally, you know, during that um, obviously very difficult time for the family and all of those assets are being allocated out, is that a time where the ATO can identify and potentially put in a claim um, for any of those uh, assets that... Obviously, we know we've talked about the family home, but let's talk about, you know, what are we talking really here about heirlooms? So jewellery, um, anything, you know, any scarce uh, asset that might be appreciating. So maybe stamp collection, coin collections, all those types of things. Is that is that where we, we run into difficulties here? 
Yeah, not if they're gone from the deceased to someone through the will. Yep. That's all right because there's a rollover in that. It's when the will says everything to my husband and, and the husband says, oh, here you go, daughter. Uh, or the far, you know, the yep, yep, spouse the passes says, here through you go, generation. daughter, yep. I'll, I'll give you this. So the passing on death is okay, but if you, if you divvy up the assets differently to the will, in other words, you're gifting, you've inherited them and you're gifting. What's well, also another great reminder about the importance of having that will in place, right? That last will and testament, that rollover provision does protect you. If you don't have something like that in place, that's potentially when, you know, the trustee or whatever who's settling the affairs, there may be a tax liability as part of that because it, it may not have been organised. Is that is that a fair statement? Well, as long as it passes on death. But what should have happened is on her deathbed, the wife should have changed to will to say, I want to give my engagement ring to my daughter. Yeah. That, it, it, that's, yeah. That's, a, that's a nice step down in terms of what that looks like. And, and hopefully when you are planning these, you know, these terrible events, um, thinking about who you do ultimately want to see it passed on to um, and having that really clearly defined in your will is going to be helpful there. Um, so that that is really interesting. Um in terms of, you know, there's often conversations around if I, you know, pass, if I give a gift of cash um, to my son or daughter to, to buy a property or something along those lines, um, that's where getting that advice is going to be really important before you actually do anything in terms of talking to your tax accountant. Well, yes, but not so much for capital gains tax on that cash because yeah. cash is not subject cash, to cash. capital gains, yeah, yeah. gains tax. But there are things and ways you can do or traps you can get yourself into and ways you can make sure, preserve the main residence exemption. But that's yeah. a topic for another time. Yeah, so. that is. But thank you. That's really helpful. Just a little reminder there. To, it's obviously that the tax office has the right to make a claim against any any asset that has that's an appreciating asset, uh, they can potentially come after. So that's why it's really important um, to be planning and talking to your accountant about that. All right, let's change pace a little here. And and Julie, the reason why I wanted to add this one for our topic of discussion today was obviously the Chinese government recently said if you're going to be uh, you know studying abroad, you need to get abroad because you need to learn. Um, uh, in that location, because otherwise we won't recognise your qualifications. So that has meant obviously a huge influx of additional international students arriving in Australia as we record. And we've got record low vacancy rates and that's putting a lot of uh, uh, pressure on rents. And so there might be a lot of people out there who are thinking, well, you know, our, our kids are now adult children, they've left the home and, and now, well, why don't we, you know, sort of talk to our local university about putting a couple of our rooms available for rent. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is, you know, what are the what are the tax consequences associated with potentially renting out a room? Um, in this example, I'm using is an international student. So, you know, firstly, my first question is, what sort of is allowable um, as part of that particular story? Well, you don't want to trigger the fact that your home is being used to produce income. Yep. And to reset the cost base to market value, you're going to have to keep records for the rest of the time you own it. And, of course, you'd have to pay tax on the income and then deduct portion of food, portion of electricity and all the rest of it. But generally, when you do rent your place out to students, the Education um, Institute has organised what they call homestay and they come and evaluate what they think it's going to cost you to have that student in your home and they set the amount and as long as this amount is only covering the actual share of food and electricity and the share of phone which just isn't an issue these days but that's what the ruling says then you're not using your home to produce income so you don't get to negative gear it either but <laughs> you don't trigger the capital gains tax provisions you don't have to put the income in of course, the catch is if you get too much, so you're doing it privately and you're trying to make a profit, please consider the consequences. It may not be worth it. So that obviously, what you're talking about there, the consequences of resetting the cap, uh, the, the cost base, and then ultimately that's going to significantly impact any capital gains exemption that you may be entitled to as your principal place of residence exemption. Um, so, so that is our big flag here. Um, we love the idea that you know you're, you you get a cultural exchange 
Um, it's a wonderful way to obviously, you know, uh, show them the, 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 the joys of the culture of Australia. If you, you know, renting out uh, your room in your home, um, I would, the, the, the tip here is definitely do it via the universities or TASE or whatever. So, you know, you, you are making sure you're staying on the right side of the law. Um, and the other big takeaway from, from what you're saying there, Julia, is that you can't profit from this. So we have seen, you know, private rulings, um, evidence of private rulings where there was a what one might consider a moderate gain of 10 odd thousand dollars for three international students. But the ATO rejected that claim on the grounds that they were profiting from renting out those rooms. Yeah, and then they have to pay tax on it. They um, trigger this but they don't get their main residence exemption over all of the property. And it's more the record keeping nightmare. So, so think about it like this. It may not, it, it's, it's not going to be a cash windfall. It's definitely going to be something that's going to be something that's going to be subject to, you know, tax review. So, but you will, um, you know, if you're a house of two and you're living there full time and you're running air conditioning and heating, and then you have one or two extra students in there, we're talking about covering the board, um, covering electricity, utilities, and that type of thing. And Julia did make mention of doesn't cover any mortgage interest payments. They're not they're not there to cover those costs. Just the household operating and running costs that will be part of that. So there might be a moderate to small um, benefit in terms of reducing your outgoings from a household point of view, but it's certainly something you can't consider to profit from. You wouldn't be doing it for the money. You'd be doing it for the cultural exchange, that's for sure. Yeah, fantastic. So I think we've, we've done that one nicely. Um, let's move on now to talk about uh, topic number four. And this one's a really interesting one because you've recently had a case there um, that you advised a client on, Julia, around um, two hectare properties. And those two hectare properties, which in the old terms, for those of you a little bit older like me, in acres, that's around five acres. Um, those five acre properties, that main residence, Tell us about any risk towards that principal place of residence concessions and the, the capital gains implications. If you are doing something that's not the just living in and enjoying the quiet enjoyment of that property, and you might be looking to adjust or something along those lines. So unpack that story for us. Okay. Um, the clear rules about your main residence's exemption is it can only cover up to two hectares and those two hectares cannot be used to produce income. So if you've got a seven hectare property, uh, sorry, a seven acre property or- uh, Yes, three, five, five property, acres to seven acre. I've got yeah, it. I'm yeah. on the old school too. Can we yeah. talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you're going to have to keep capital gains tax records. There's no doubt about that because some of that property is going to be subject to capital gains tax. And the best um, tax, um, not scam, tax um, deduction, tax strategy. That's the word. There's Best the word. Tax, <laughs> tax, tax strategy, strategy. I like that word. <laughs> is good record keeping. That's what all my spreadsheets are about. Let's get these record keeping right and the tax office is can cry all the way to the bank. So they need to then, right from the time they buy the property, if it's more than five acres, they need to keep you know, track of all the rates, the slashing costs and that. And they need to divvy it up, in my opinion, right from the start and say, well, that two acres over there out of the seven, that will be um, exposed to capital gains tax. Yeah. Now, once you've done that, you, you're going to pick that two acres carefully. Now, if you've got flood land down the back, of no value now and no value when you sell it. That's where you kick your two acres to oh, so that good. you can say, all right, yes, you can wear your capital gains tax on that, but let's see, it was worth nothing when I bought it. It's cost me this much to slash it. Do I get a capital loss? Thank you very much, you know, because it's worth nothing when you sell it. Um, what you can do to mess it up is stop using the five acres you try to protect for private purposes. So the local farmer comes in and says, can I adjust my property, my cattle on your property? You've just blown it because that, that part is being used to produce income. So it's not being used for private purposes. So only let them on that two acres of flood land. Um, it's not so bad if you use it in a business. Now, adjustment is not considered a business. Adjustment, you can't even use that to negative gear the property. But if you use some of the area, say the two 
acres that you've got in excess in a business, then you may get the small business um, concessions that will eliminate the capital gain anyway. But you have to use it in a business for at least half the time you own it or seven and a half years, whichever is the shortest period. So the idea is to go on Google Maps, get a satellite picture, divvy it up, make a plan right from the day you move there and beat the tax man in the end. I think this is great advice. I mean, obviously, we saw through the pandemic that, you know, there was a flight to, you know, the, the tree change and and certainly move out to hobby properties and those types of things where you've got a little bit more acreage. Um, so this is a timely reminder that, you know, small percentage of the population who are doing that, that they think clearly about that five acres and, and ring fence that around you know, their property and their, you know, where the capital gain is going to happen there. And to Julia's point, if you've got 20 acres and some of it is covered in thick bushland and so forth, well, ultimately that is not, you know, in terms of its productive use and its ultimate valuation in the future is going to be uh, poorer um, in terms of whereas the actual part of the land that is that is uh, quiet enjoyment and, and you're adding value, making nice gardens, um, improving the, the property there, it's basically really clear that that needs to be in your circle of your five acres or your two hectares in terms of how you do that. But to Julia's point, clean record keeping. Um, and to my point that I always make in these episodes is talk to your tax accountant, you know, get a plan in place, get, you know, understand the record keeping that you need to make, um, document them clearly, and then put them into the digital filing cabinet of the future um, and keep them there ready to go. And your accountant's aware of, of the decisions that were being made. And ultimately, that will put you in good stead is probably how I'd summarise that. Julie, you got anything further that you want to add? Make sure your executor knows where these records are. Oh, great tip. A lot of people, yes, you know, if, you, if your partner, your executor, all of those people don't know where you're storing all this information and, you know, God forbid you hit by a bus, um, geez, it makes it difficult to, you know, when the tax man comes and says, I don't have any record of, of which part of this land was, um, you know, a provision for the, the main residence exemption. Um, and you know, so they can and they can be difficult. So that's a I think that's a beautiful little tip there at the end of uh, item number four on our on our card today, Julia. So thanks for that one. Um, it is a good segue into um, the final talking point for today, which is really around this uh, this new windfall tax that we've seen introduced in Victoria. So um, if I could uh, take the floor here, and um, we have had, had a little bit of a chat about this recently on the podcast, but it's uh, it's quite interesting in terms of what they've done. So using exactly the same methodology of two hectares or, or just under that five acres, um, what we've seen is that this new windfall tax commences on the 1st of July, 2023, um, but relates to contracts entered into after the 15th of May, 2021, um, and commercial decisions made now. So ultimately, um, you know, the, the person who's owned the property when that decision was made, even though the law is taking effect from the 1st of July, there's a retrospective element of that back to the 15th of May, 2021. Um, so not just last year, but the year before that. Now, it applies to all rezoned land in Victoria over two hectares, with limited exemptions. So there might be the odd exemption. So you might want to talk to your tax accountant about what those exemptions are. The landowner, um, uh, the land owner at the date of rezoning is liable for to pay the tax. The date of rezoning is determined under the Planning and Environment Act of 1987 and is uh, not within the client's control. So this is the interesting bit here, and this is the bit that you know might shock a few people. It's like, oh, I'm enjoying my quiet enjoyment of my property that's 20 acres uh, on the fringe of town. And yes, I see suburbia catching up to me, but all of a sudden, with the stroke of a pen, um, they've rezoned my, my 20 acres plus another 120 acres into residential uh, zoning. Um, that windfall um, is what they're talking about here, and that's where they apply the tax. So what we have seen um, is if the windfall is greater than 100,000 but below 500,000 as, as measured by the capital improved value. So that's the land value um, as part of that rezoning. You're up for 62.5% tax on that amount. Um, anything above 
the 500,000, you're up for 50% in tax payable. So yes, there's a significant uplift in the value of your land if you get rezoning to a higher productive use. We talked a lot about the value of higher productive use land and that's why it's so expensive. But wow we, I just wanted to keep living on my hobby farm and my my you know my my property that's out and out on the, the sticks of the town. And I've got now this massive tax liability. And if I don't pay it within 30 days, um, I then can uh, get a loan structure in place of which there's going to be interest charging me over the next 30 years um, until su such time as I sell that property, um, which could, you know, the interest is capitalizing on interest, all of a sudden, you know, that windfall. So it's going to force a lot of sales um, and it's going to really make an impact on a couple of livelihoods for those people who had no intention and what weren't interested in making a quick, uh, you know, financial gain um, in terms of subdividing their land. But um, that's that's here in Victoria. Um, you know, watch this space in terms of what happens across Australia. But did you have anything further that, you know, or any comments that you wanted to make on that particular one, Julia? Well, we work all our life to pay off our ideal dream home or whatever. And we don't really own it at all, do we? We've got to pay the rates on it. We've got the, the, the government's got all the rights to what's under the thin layer underneath, you can't chop the trees down, you're going to pay tax if it goes up in value too much. What are we working all our life for? Well, it's a good question. Yes, that that whole mining one is another can of worms where yes, you only own the topsoil, but anything under that the government owns it. They want to put tunnels or or they want to mine that particular land. So it's it really is true. Um, obviously, uh, you know, there is a financial windfall that will come to those households. But yeah, we you know the, the home is your castle, and um, that land that you were just talking about that uh, that may not always be the case. You just can't stop progress, um, and I suppose the other message here is you can't stop taxes. Um, is one of those stories. So um, there we go, um, episode four. Um, what we were talking about there is talking property tax with Julia Hartman. I want to just close out a couple of things uh, if I can. Um, the first one I want to talk about here is that with the previous episodes. You can view those on the Empower Wealth website or also on our YouTube channel. So check them out. And the reason why I say that is I just want to quickly run through those topics. Again, if you're new um, to uh, these educational tax series that we've been putting together. So in episode one, we talked about the five top tax rules every property investor must understand. So starting with negative gearing and then turning your principal place of residence into an investment property. Uh, what is the six-year rule? Renting out your principal place of residence or holiday home into an income-producing asset or turning that into an income-producing asset. And then the big tax change that's going to happen in 2024 in terms of the stage three tax cuts, we talk about those. In episode two, part one, we were talking about tips to minimise your tax return. And we looked at things like making your own super contributions. We talked about best practice of your personal uh, tax bookkeeping. So that's what we're passionate about. And coming back to Julia's point about good record keeping and your end of year considerations for property investors. In uh, episode two, part two, we then built on that talking about claiming uh, car travel expenses, uh, travel expenses in general to inspect investment properties, the changes to the rules and the fact that you can't make any claims there. And then we also took a look at the depreciation schedule claims that were also available back then and what's also now available to you to claim. In episode three, um, we, we we doubled down and double clicked more on some of the, tech, uh, the car uh, expenses. So salary sacrificing for a car, is it a good idea? Um, Julia gave us a great tip about when buying an electric car, what to, what to consider as part of that. And then we pivoted and talked about private health insurance in terms of is it worth it? So um, check out those past episodes. Finally, in terms of uh, another sort of a recommendation for you, um, a couple of weeks ago, Julia joined us on the Property Couch podcast and Bryce and I um, took her, took her uh, expertise and put it in place in regards to, you know, entities and structures. So what sort of, what should I consider in terms of which entity or structure should I buy my investment property? We covered off on company, uh, tax, uh, Smurfs, self-managed super fund, trusts, and also buying in your personal name and then percentage of ownership shares uh, of that particular property. So that's the, the Property Couch episode number 
434, um, if you'd like to check that out. Um, in terms of our next episode, uh, which we're going to do in May in preparation for the, for the end of the financial year again. So we're going to sort of talk about tax planning um, and double, double, double down on that in terms of what's going to be happening around uh, your tax planning to get that right before 30 June, um, when your tax is then due for your tax return and compliance work to be done. So Julia, uh, firstly, uh, thank you again for your invaluable knowledge. Um, Julia has uh, amazing books, um, excellent blogs on all of these interesting topics. Uh, you can check out all of that content uh, at the Band Tax website, um, and you can follow the prompts to all of that uh, amazing insight. She's got some awesome spreadsheets um, available there as well uh, for that record keeping as part of that. And so thank you for, for coming on to the show, Julia. Thank you for having me, Ben. It's been fun. Now, next time, also remember two important things. The takeaways I always say, remind everyone that before you make any investment decision, it's always best practice to make sure you keep your accountant in the loop. Um, we recently had the band tax conference here in Melbourne, um, and it's just hearing the stories of people who made decisions that are going to have big capital gains implications or no tax planning associated with them. And we just scratch our heads um, the, the amount of money that's just donated to the government or the tax office because of poor tax planning is a real true thing. And so that's what we're trying to also overcome by introducing this tax planning and tax education series with Julia. And finally, as I always say, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. And so until we see you next time, please take care and bye for now. <laughs>